Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We got a Passover communion special for you today. Uh, If you have not yet done so, you might want to gather uh, a small piece of unleavened bread, a small piece of soda cracker will suffice, uh, a small amount of any red wine, or if you prefer, grape juice. It's all symbolic of the blood of Christ. So uh, the title to, we're going to be doing a communion service, by the way, at the end of this hour is the reason I suggest you gather your uh, materials now. Uh, The title of our message today, our Passover special, is The Lord Will Provide. Yahweh Yuri in the Hebrew tongue. Uh, And the Lord does provide. Uh, We have needs that uh, in, in serving Him and producing fruit for Him. Uh, Jesus taught us in John chapter 15, verse 16, that if we need something to produce fruit for the Lord, all we have to do is ask in His name, and the Lord will provide. Yahweh Yuri. Uh, we're going to begin our lesson today in Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. I invite you to get your Bible and join us as we begin our study concerning the Lord will provide. Chapter 22 of Genesis, uh, verse 1, and it reads, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham, and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. The the Lord tempted Abraham. Probably better translated, the Lord proved uh, Abraham. You know, there's a spiritual war going on. It's good against evil. It's the Lord against Satan. And the Lord has weapons. And if you're one of His elect, you are one of His weapons. And as Pastor Arnold Murray used to say frequently, He'll test your okra every once in a while to make sure that he can depend on you, that he can trust you, that that you will obey when he gives you instruction. Verse 2, And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. Christ was God's only begotten son. Do you see the type? Whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Moriah, according to the Smith's Bible Dictionary, should, it can be translated chosen by God. Now there's a couple of things here that would raise questions in Abraham's mind. Earlier, Genesis chapter 21 verse 12, God told Abraham that in Isaac, his son, would his seed be called. In other words, all your your descendants are going to come through Isaac. Now, the descendants of Eth Ha'adam were not in the practice of making human sacrifice. There were other peoples on earth that did sacrifice humans, but uh, the descendants of Eth Ha'adam were not. Will Abraham question uh, these uh, questions to the Lord? And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him, his servants. And Isaac his son and clave or cut the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place uh, of which God had told him. No questions. In in Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter, in in verse 17, it states there that Abraham, uh, by faith, 
uh, when he was tried, offered up his only son, Isaac. No question, though, he's, he's following God's instruction. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off, Mount Moriah. And Abraham said unto his young men, his servants, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Now, this is interesting. He knows he's going to sacrifice Isaac and following God's instructions, but he's saying, we will return to you. And if we go back to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19, we learn there that Abraham trusted the Lord that he would raise Isaac from the dead. Uh, it states there in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19 just as the Lord would raise His only begotten Son from the dead some 1,900 years after these events came to pass. Verse 5, uh, we got that. Verse 6, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son to carry. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together, no doubts. He's, he's, he's doing what the Lord expected him to do and asked him to do to the letter. He's carried the fire in his hand. No doubt this was fire from his altar at home, and he wouldn't pick it up in his hand, of course. Uh, he would have a censer uh, to carry the, the coals in. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Isaac, no doubt, had seen sacrifices at home, witnessed many of them. And he's saying, uh, Hey, father, we've got the wood, We've got the fire. I see you've got a knife there. Where's the ram? Where's, where's the lamb that we're going to sacrifice? John chapter 1, verse 29 in the New Testament, uh, when he saw Jesus Christ, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And just as the Lord is going to provide a ram to sacrifice in the place of Abraham's only son, Isaac, uh, he offered up the Lord Jesus Christ uh, on the cross as the Passover lamb. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb, better, the lamb in the Hebrew language, for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Yuri Yeshua, provide himself in the Hebrew language. And they came to the place which God had told him of, Moriah, Golgotha, in the Latin language, Calvary, the Mount of Olives, whatever you want to call it, it's all the same place. This is the same location where Jesus Christ would be crucified. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Verse 10, And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. By faith, Abraham, when tried, offered up his son Isaac. He's going through with this. Uh, the Lord's going to stop him, as we'll see, and provide a replacement uh, for Isaac. He won't provide a replacement for his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Verse 11, And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. Abraham, if you translate it uh, rather than transliterate, it means father of a multitude. And he has faith. He trusts in God completely. 
and he in, in the companion Bible, the H is a capital letter appropriately, said, this is the Lord speaking, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And neither would God withhold his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. But the Lord tempted or tested Abraham, and he, uh, he proved him a better word. And Abraham proved that he trusted God and that he would obey. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. God provided the sacrifice as he would some 1900 years later. And Abraham called the name of the place Yahweh Uri, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen, Mount Moriah. And of course, in, most of you know in the Hebrew language there is no letter J equivalent. So uh, when this read Jehovah Jiri, uh, I pronounce it Yahweh, the sacred name, Yuri, which the, uh, is a Y uh, equivalent in the Hebrew alphabet. If you have a companion Bible, make a note of Appendix 4. Uh, two, the Roman numeral two, and then number one. And Yahweh Yuri is one of the names for our Heavenly Father. The Lord will provide can also be translated, the Lord will see to it. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time. The angel of the Lord, 99% of the time when you uh, read that, it is Yahweh himself. Verse 16, And said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. And you, there is no greater entity that you can swear by. For because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. And in blessing I will bless thee. And in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. This is a figure of speech that means that you'll have the victory over your enemies. Well, where are all these children of Abraham today, as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sands of the seashore. Well, they're scattered all over the world, but a good number of them went north over the Caucasus Mountains, uh, later settling uh, into Europe and eventually uh, many of them migrating to the United States and Canada. Most of them don't have a clue that they are descendants of Israel. Verse 18, And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Note the star at the end of that verse in most of your Bibles. That star means that this verse has Messiah connotation, means it relates to Jesus Christ. And of course, the, uh, the, the, the nations of the world uh, everyone is blessed by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, uh, providing salvation and forgiveness of sins to the world. The Lord will provide. Yahweh Yuri. The fact that Jesus would be sacrificed was prophesied uh, by King David some uh, almost a thousand years before the actual crucifixion. Turn with me to Psalm 22 as we can continue our Passover message. Psalm 22. Most people think that Psalm 23 
is the death psalm. Uh, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but actually Psalm 23 is the Messiah, the great shepherd in resurrection. The death psalm is Psalm 22. Uh, most of you that have been through the psalms with me know that uh, many times what appears to be the superscription or the title to a psalm uh, actually, and this is the case with Psalm 22, the reason I mention it, to the chief musician upon Aijileth Shahar belongs as a subscription, uh, a footnote, if you will, to Psalm 21, the previous psalm. The title or the sub superscription to Psalm 22 is simply a psalm of David. Verse 1, and it reads, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Again, we have a star at the end of that verse, meaning that it pertains to Jesus Christ. If you went to the New Testament, Matthew 27, verse 46, as Jesus was on the cross, he would cry out, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatane, which interpreted means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God did not forsake Jesus Christ. Number one, Jesus never called God, God. He called him Father. Uh, also, <clears throat> a thing to note on this is that what, as Jesus was hanging on the cross, he was saying, look, this was all written almost a thousand years ago. You see, David, as it's written in Acts chapter 2, was a prophet. This is prophecy of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Verse 2, O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. David is in troubled times here. There's no rest for David. But thou art holy, O oh thou that, in, uh, that inhabitest the praises of Israel, inhabits the sanctuary where the praises of Israel are offered. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. He parted the Red Sea uh, as they crossed over. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. This word confounded means ashamed or confused. And they walked over on dry land and crossed the Red Sea. As Pharaoh's armies pursued after them, the seas came crashing back in, totally destroying uh, the armies of Pharaoh. Verse 6, But I am a worm and no man. Uh, ish is the Hebrew word. I'm not a great man. A reproach of men and despised of the people. Uh, Christ took the lowest place and he did it for you and me. This reproach of men, they, they reproached him, all right. They spat upon him, and that was not all. Verse 7, all they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, or they open the lip for what comes out of their mouth. They shake the head, saying, shaking the head is a, a gesture of surprise uh, and astonishment at something unexpected or strange. Matthew 27, 39 reads, They reviled him, wagging their heads. This is prophecy of the crucifixion. He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Christ of Christ, they said to him, he delivered others, but himself he cannot deliver. But thou art he that took me out of the womb, and thou didst make me hope or trust when I was upon 
my mother's breast. Even as a babe, you watched over me. And this might bring to mind in uh, Matthew chapter 2, verse 16, Herod had all of the children, infants, two years and down, slain, trying to slay Jesus Christ. Uh, God, of course, gave Mo uh, Joseph and Mary, the parents of Jesus, uh, the stepfather of Jesus, in, in Joseph's case, uh, heads up, and they fled before Jesus was along those that were killed. I was cast upon thee from the womb, or you were my God uh, from the time I was in the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. In the case of Jesus, Peter denied Christ that he knew him three times. Uh, Jesus was totally, completely alone in his wondrous work. Be not far from me for trouble as we got that. Verse 12, many bulls, which is symbolic of enemies, have compassed me, they've surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. The bulls of Bashan known for their tremendous size. They gaped upon me with their mouths. The false uh, witnesses made up lies about what Jesus said in order to convict him. As a ravening and a roaring lion, in Mark chapter 15, verse 13, when they were deciding whether they wanted to release Barabbas or Jesus, who was completely innocent, Mark Bar uh, Barabbas was guilty of over 400 murders. They uh, yelled, crucify him concerning Jesus, and they wanted Barabbas, the murderous Barabbas, released instead of Jesus. I am poured out like water. This uh, poured out in the Hebrew is shafak. It means to spill forth blood. And all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels as they nailed his feet and his hands to that cross and then raised him up, gravity pulling his bones from socket. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My mouth is as dry as a potsherd. And my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. John 19, 28, he would say, I thirst. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs, again symbolic of enemies, have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Nailed to the cross. Mixed in with uh, these chief priests that crucified cross, you had... Kenites, of course. I may tell or count all my bones, they look and stare upon me. At one point they said, he calls for Elias. Leave him alone. Maybe Elijah will come. And they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Matthew 27, 35. Mark 15, 24, Luke 23, 34, all prophesy that the Roman soldiers would part his garments and cast lots upon his jacket. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength, haste thee to help me. <clears throat> Verse 20, Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, or my only one, from the power of the dog, the enemies. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. Poor, poor translation. There is no place in God's word for fantasy or fairy tales. Uh, we all know a unicorn is a mythical character. This should have been translated, 
uh, wild ox, probably the bulls uh, of Bashan in verse 12. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise thee. Note the star following the verse. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12. Jesus did declare and praise God in the church. Verse 14 goes on to say that in that the children of God uh, came through the flesh once, uh, so did Jesus Christ, so that he might defeat death, that is to say, who he, ha who he, he who has the power over death, that is the devil. That's the reason that Jesus Christ came to earth in the flesh, was to defeat Satan. O oh, death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? Ye that fear the Lord, or revere the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, the twelve natural seed line, glorify him and fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. For he, referring to God, hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. The Lord did not forsake Jesus Christ on the cross. He heard. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. Do you praise him among your brothers and sisters? I hope so. I will pay my vows before them that fear him, that revere the Lord. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart or your mind shall live forever. Eternal life available because of the price he paid on the cross. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. Everyone's going to repent. And all the kindreds of the nations, even the Gentiles, the ethnos, shall worship before thee. On the first day of the millennium, every uh, tongue will confess, every knee will bow. For the kingdom is the Lord's, the king in his dominion. And he is the governor among the nations. He's the ruler. And this particularly applies when he returns as king of kings and lord of lords uh, as the, at the second advent when the millennium begins. And they that be far, uh, be fat, I should say, upon earth shall eat and worship uh, the rich, in other words. All they that go down to the dust, the poor, in other words, everyone, the rich and poor and everything in between shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. There is only one way to salvation. And it's not building a tower of Babylon to climb up to heaven if there's another flood. It's not cryogenics where people freeze their bodies in an attempt to live forever. It's not cloning. If you don't know the only way to salvation, I encourage you to find out and to meet Jesus Christ because that is the only salvation, the only way. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. Which generation? The last one. It's called the generation of the fig tree. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he hath done this. This last phrase in John chapter 19 verse 30 reads, uh, it is uh, finished. And that is the equivalent to he hath done this. Let's turn to the book of Matthew as we study the events that led up to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Let's go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26 is a long chapter. It's 75 verses. 
We're not going to cover all of them, but we're going to cover quite a few. Matthew chapter 26, verse 1. And it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, this is not addressed to the multitude, this is addressed to the disciples only. You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Jesus did a very good job of preparing the disciples for what was going to happen. Not all of it sunk in. He told them to meet him in Galilee after the crucifixion. Uh, two of them, you may recall, were going the wrong direction to Emmaus uh, to take some hot baths. Then assembled together the chief priest and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas. Now, this high priest was not appointed by God. He was appointed by the Romans, and most of these elders and scribes uh, were as well. Many of them were Kenites who had slipped in. Teach who crucified Jesus. The Kenites were involved. Verse 4, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety. That's deceit or trickery and kill him. Mm, very nice religious group. Why do they want Christ killed? Well, he's hurting their business. The multitudes are seeing the miracles uh, of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus and leaving their church. But they said, not on the feast day, not on the Passover, lest there be an uproar among the people. God's plan called for Christ to be crucified on the Passover. Uh, God's plan always comes to pass. God is in control. <clears throat> now, when Jesus was in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, and of course Simon had to have been healed as a leper, or he wouldn't have been in Bethany. Uh, lepers were outcasts. They were not allowed to reside in a city or a town. There came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. Now this is not to be confused with the woman who uh, anointed Christ's feet with oil or ointment. Uh, this anointing is for burial. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? This ointment is worth a lot of money. Uh, why are we wasting it this way? It's expensive. For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, why trouble ye the woman? Leave her alone, for she hath wrought a good work upon me. Verse 11, For ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. He was going to be crucified on the cross. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verse 13, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever, wheresoever, this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, including right now, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, uh, be told for a memorial for her. She's not even mentioned by name, but uh, I can assure you she knows who she is. Verse 14, then one of the twelve, the twelve disciples of Christ, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest, verse 15, and said unto them, What will you give me, and I will deliver him unto you? I'll betray Jesus unto you. And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. They didn't decide on this 30 pieces of silver. It had been decided uh, hundreds of years prior. 
Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12, 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. What would your price be to betray Jesus? Well, I know most of you said there is no price for me to betray Jesus. When I'm delivered up before the Antichrist, I will not betray Christ for any amount of money or for anything else. And from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. This was also written of early on, Psalms 41, 9. My old familiar friend, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has raised his heel against me. Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? You know, people ask me, Well, you're a Christian. Why do you celebrate Passover? I answer many times because Jesus Christ celebrated the Passover. Uh, we're to follow his example as best we can, and therefore we celebrate the Passover. The original Passover in the time of Moses, it was the blood of the lamb, the Passover lamb, uh, on the doorpost that caused the death angel to pass over the occupants inside when the death angel was uh, slaying the firstborn of all the Egyptians. Just as the blood of the Passover lamb in the time of Moses caused the death angel to pass over, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ causes the death angel to pass over you as well. You can have eternal life. Verse 18, and he said, go into the city to such a man. This was all prearranged, planned out, nothing left to chance. And say unto him, the master saith, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. Verse 19, and the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Jesus is the Passover lamb this particular year. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, truly I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Christ knew which would betray him. All the others, though, are troubled. Uh, they're wondering, could it possibly be me? All of them except, of course, Judas Iscariot. Not only did Christ know who, which one it was, Judas did as well. He'd already had the 30 pieces of silver in his bag. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? Could it possibly be me? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. Betrayed by his trusted friend who did eat his bread. At this time, they would take uh, one bowl, a large bowl, and put the meat that was going to be eaten, if there were any, and broth, and then they dipped, or sopped, it's called in the Bible, the bread into it, and then ate. Verse 24, the Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. We read it in Psalm 22. We could have read about it in Isaiah 53. But woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born because of the shame. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He already knew. He said unto him, Thou hast said. Let's skip ahead to verse 47, which is where the actual betrayal of Jesus occurs. Verse 47, the same chapter 26. And while he, Jesus, yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude, with swords and staves, clubs, if you will, 
from the chief priest and elders of the people. Verse 48, Now he, this being Judas, that betrayed him, gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same as he, hold him fast, seize him. The one I kiss is the one I'm betraying. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him, the kiss of betrayal. This word hail is an Aramaic salutation, uh, very similar to the Greek, uh, is it peace? It's not peace that Judas is bringing to Christ. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Or better, do what you have come to do. Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. If we read John chapter 18, verse 10, we would learn that Peter is the disciple that drew his sword and severed the ear. Uh, and we would learn in Luke 22:51 that the servant of the high priest was Malchus. Of course, Jesus uh, placed the ear back on Malchus and touched it and healed him. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword unto his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Peter would be utilized uh, to go on and found the church of Christ. Verse 53, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me <clears throat> more than twelve legions of angels. Thousands of thousands of angels. And yes, Jesus could have called on the Lord to deliver him from what was about to happen. He did not. Why? He knew the scripture had to be fulfilled. He knew the price had to be paid on the cross for so that we could have salvation. Verse 54, and how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? In that same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. Why now? Jesus knew why now. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. The shepherd smitten, the flock scattered. Chapter 26, verse 31, also written of in the Old Testament, Zechariah, chapter 13, verse 7. The crucifixion was prophesied. And as all prophecies of God, it would come to pass. In conclusion, turn with me to John chapter 19. John chapter 19, we're going to pick it up with verse 12. And it reads, And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, if thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. That's what they accused Christ of claiming to be the king, which, of course, Caesar wouldn't be happy with Jesus claiming to be king because he's the king. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabatha. Gabatha means elevated. It was the place of judgment. Pavement, interesting, it's in the Greek, lithos trotos, and it was a mosaic uh, pattern in the floor of the tribunal 
of the Romans. Again, the place of judgment. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away, spitting on him. Uh, one would uh, make a crown of thorns and they would place it on his head. And the thorns pierced his forehead to where the blood ran down his face. One, while Jesus was blindfolded, would strike the Lord and say, Prophesy who struck thee. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 states that when Jesus returns at the second advent, those who pierced him will be some of the first to see it. Uh, I'm sure they will be shaking in their boots. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, Mount Moriah, Golgotha, Calvary, the Mount of Olives, whatever you want to call it, by what name you wish to call it, it's the same place, the same place that Abraham was tested and offered up his only son, Isaac where they crucified him and two other with him, on either side one and Jesus in the midst. Isaiah chapter 53, 9 uh, prophesies this, states that he made his grave with the wicked. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. He was actually the king of of all of Israel, soon to be uh, the king of the universe, king of kings, lord of lords. This title then read many of the Jews, the inhabitants of Judah, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin, Pilate mocking those who crucified Jesus. Then said the chief priest, uh, Caiaphas, of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. They didn't look upon him as their king. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. It stands just as written. This is the crime you accused uh, Jesus of. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to either soldier a part and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam woven from the top throughout. This would be a coat similar to the chief priest, the high priest. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it or tear it, but cast lots for it. It wouldn't be any good to any of us if we tear it in four parts. Whose it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did, fulfilling the prophecy we read in Psalm 22:18. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, Mary, of course, and his mother's sister, <clears throat> Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. Then when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, that would be John, the writer of this book, he saith unto his mother, Woman, Behold thy son, referring to the disciple he loved, John. Then said he to his disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. 
John would take uh, the responsibility of caring for the mother of Jesus, Mary, since he would no longer be able to. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst, Psalm 69, 21. We also read it uh, previously. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. Verse 30, to conclude, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the spirit. It reads ghost, but I prefer spirit. My Lord is not uh, some spook. Fulfilling, uh, or I should say in Psalm 22, verse 31, it, uh, he hath done this, it reads, the same as it is finished. And of course, uh, we can celebrate the Passover uh, knowing that the reason we celebrate the Passover is that Jesus did not die. He was killed in the flesh, but he went into that tomb and praise God, three and a half days later, he resurrected. And that is what we celebrate the Passover. I invite you at this time to uh, get the materials, the, uh, the bread and the wine or grape juice if you prefer. And I want to encourage you, if you have a petition that you want to ask of the Lord. This is a good time to do it. Yahweh Jiri, the Lord will provide. If perhaps you're ill and you need a healing, ask. That's all you have to do, Jesus said in, in John 15, 16. If you need something to produce fruit for the Lord, ask in his name. Well, how is my healing going to produce fruit. Well, you can't produce fruit or as much fruit if you're sick. Ask. Perhaps you need a renewal of spirit. You can't produce fruit if your spirit is broken. So ask the Lord. And you know, I think it's very special to our Heavenly Father when one of His children asks for one of His other children by that I mean if you know of someone who is in need of a healing, a renewal of spirit, uh, financial uh, security, ask Yahweh Jiri. On the night that Christ was betrayed, he took the bread and he blessed it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take ye and eat ye all of it. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, that Jesus was willing to take the stripes, Father, that we might get the healing, Father. He became the bread of life, bread that if we partake of, then we will live eternally. We thank you, Father, for that. Soon after, Jesus took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, this is my blood, which is shed for many. Take ye and drink ye all of it. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for that precious blood of the lamb, the Passover lamb, Father, that gives us remission of sins, Father. We all fall short in the flesh, Father. If we're honest with ourselves, we're all sinners. That blood washes that sin away. We thank you for that, Father. We thank you for uh, your son that you offered on the cross. And I, we know Abraham was willing to do it. We know you did it, Father. We thank you for that. Uh, we let everything that we do the rest of this day be a reflection of the love that is Jesus Christ. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So there we have it, uh, the Passover uh, special. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it brought a blessing in your life. 
And I know that the Lord blesses those who love and serve Him. I do love you all. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. He loves you because you enjoy studying His Word in depth as well. Blessings always follow. Be blessed, my friends. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldee, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter, and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.